Jad Abirand, welcome to the public. Uh, th thank you for thank you for talking with me. It's uh, it's such a great delight to have you on. I've, I've, I'm a big fan of the show. I, I want to get to the actual idea of Radio Lab and, and talk about the program itself. But first, I'm curious to ask you a bit about what you were like growing up and, and the path that you took uh, to actually to get here where you are today. One of the things that I, I would say most defines the show would be uh, at its heart, it's, it's asking big questions, like the, the, some, some of the essential questions of, of life, religion, life, death, goodness, evil. And I was wondering, were you the type of person growing up, a uh, type of child who, who was contemplating big questions from early on, at least, at least in some form? Hmm. In, in, in a way, in a way. So it's funny. It's like, I, you know what I was thinking about when you were asking that question? I was thinking about, I mean, you're right. That is sort of the thing that drives the show. It's like these really big, like religious sized questions that we'll like try and investigate and usually ultimately fail to answer. But I always find actually as an interviewer, even now, I sometimes have a trouble finding the right questions to ask. So for me, sometimes the questions are the things that you get to second in the stream, in the process that you go through. Sometimes I have to walk a little bit to get to the right questions. But as a kid, I don't know. I mean, I was this Arab kid growing up in like this Southern Baptist universe in the early 90s, right around Gulf War number one. You were in Tennessee. Tennessee. And uh, I spent a lot of time in my room as a consequence. And so I always kind of felt slightly apart from the culture. And so there was that sort of like distance where you can sort of look at things and kind of wonder where you fit into this and why things work the way that they work. Had I been sort of more naturally a part of things, maybe I wouldn't have thought to, to sort of have that distance to ask the questions. So that had something to do with it. But I think actually the thing that really sort of turned me on wasn't so much that kind of surface level curiosity, but it's like what happens right after you find the right question to ask. You feel that weird, strange fever of suddenly looking at the world in a new way. And I, w I got addicted to that feeling, not more so than the, than the questions. It was the feeling of like suddenly having your perspective just jolted really hard. And there was something new to discover. Yeah, that there was some like suddenly the world was just filled with wonder and weirdness. And initially for me, I connected to it through music. I mean, I, I was like literally what I would do in Nashville is I would sit in my room and I had this four track cassette player and I would make these long evolving film scores for movies that hadn't been written you know i was just imagining a movie and being like oh i could I make i could make a film score for it um really so just completely imaginary movies yeah totally like, like you, you know, have like a rough idea of like boy meets uh, girl or something see, yeah well sort of like they'd be roughed out in terms of plot but more just in terms of like the feelings of the decisive moments of the movie like these like mo these dreamscapey moments where whatever action was taking place had a decisive shift and the characters transformed like that moment and the feeling in those moments, the feeling in the music is the feeling that you get when the world seems strange and magical and, and new and weird. And so I became very addicted to that, almost in a sort of like musical level. And then for me, like walking into journalism was a way of realizing that if you find the right questions to ask, you can suddenly stumble into these moments of wonder. And so I'm always searching for those moments, which for me feel almost musical. They don't feel in a sense intellectual in a way but if you find the right question to ask you can open the door into those moments so i sort of began at backwards i mean i think robert when you talk to him you'll find like he's a much more sort of like things begin with a question for him like he has that kind of crazy driving curiosity and uh he thinks of the question very quickly and then he needs to know the answer uh for me sometimes it's the opposite I have a sense that I want to feel the way I feel when I ask the right question. And so I find the right question to ask. So I want to go back to, to what you mentioned. So you were this Arab kid in, in Tennessee and, and it was the first call for, I mean, how, how much of an outsider did you, did you really feel? Was it, was it quite acute? Did you, did you have a big group of friends at school or was it, were you really quite solitary? For most of it, I mean, it wasn't, I, I wouldn't, I don't, I wouldn't put too fine a point on it because it was, I mean, th there's a difference between like an Arab like me and like a really dark skinned Arab. I feel like those two situations are completely different. But for me, it was just feeling like you were just kind of the square peg, you know, it just kind of felt that my entire life. Uh, going to college was the first time where like you, you could stand in a room full of other weirdos and be like, oh, okay, there's a lot of us who felt this way. But at the time it was just, you know, 
I mean, I remember in 1980, like, you know, the bombing of the American embassy. That was a very strange time to be an Arab kid in Tennessee. And I remember like having very strange conversations with people that I couldn't really process. 1991, like people didn't really know how to process it. So it wasn't like a racism in any kind of overt sense. It was just like people were confused by me. And as a result, I was confused by me. You know, like you, you're trying to figure out who you are by queuing off of others. And I always felt a little uneasy about it. Like my parents who, you know, who, who moved here from Lebanon, for them, it was in a way much simpler. You know, it was about trying to find a way to strategically enter this new culture. For me being born there, I just felt kind of just confused. I wasn't quite sure where I stood. Whether um, like between, were you Lebanese, were you an American? Yeah, and like, you know, we would go to Lebanon all the time and there I was entirely the American, you know? And so it was just always, you always felt somehow in between things. Um, in America, you're the Lebanon guy and in totally, Lebanon, you're yeah. the American dude. Yeah, exactly. Um, and like, I remember in Tennessee at that point, it was very like, the fact that we didn't go to church was very weird for people. Uh, and I remember like Sundays being this annoying day where I almost wanted to hide because I wasn't in church and like you'd see your friends and the parents look at you like, you're not in church? And now it just sounds stupid. And then you could stupid. just pull on them, well, you're not in church. No, I know. It doesn't. It just sounds stupid to say it now, but it was like a big deal for me when I was growing up. Like um, I, always, I would always try and convince my parents to take me to church just because I was like, isn't this what people do? Shouldn't we be doing it too? But now, now I'm like, God, oh, that's ridiculous. But And what did your parents say about it? Well, it was just, it didn't, it didn't compute for them. They're both scientists. They were like, why would we go to church, you know? Um, and for them, they came from Lebanon uh, out of this war that was driven by, like, sectarian violence and, and religious difference. So they were like, get me as far away from that as possible. Uh, they wanted no part of it. Yeah, I mean, for them, it was just everything that was wrong with the world. Uh, but for me, it was everything that was keeping us from integrating with these people, you know? So it was the it was difference on that level. It was just like somehow we didn't fit the norm, and it was just it that gave me a certain distance from things, which actually I'm kind of grateful for now. Because you know, I don't know. It's like it's that sense of like I always feel like what we're doing now in our in our reporting is like exploring the weird tensions between things, and I just feel like I was always there to begin with, and so that it makes sense to me. I feel like I can draw on my early childhood memories as we're like going into these new topics. Somehow it, it, there's a feedback loop that works. Well, it occurs to me if, if you feel outside of, of things, then there's a whole bunch of things that you can't really take for granted that for most people are just you know, fish in water. It's, you don't yeah. even know you're, you're wet. Whereas if, if you're not a part, then you have to think about these things very intently, like whether or not you go to church and why you should go to church or not. Totally. That's a better way of putting it, actually. Yeah, that's exactly right. Exactly right. Yeah. So, so you end up going to Oberlin, and, mm -hmm. and so you, you were thinking about, well, you did go into music composition. So that was your dream that you were pursuing? Yeah, I mean, ever since I was like five or six, that was the, th that was the idea. Was, uh, I'm not quite sure where I got the idea, but I wanted to write music for films. Because that's such a specific idea to have, and one wouldn't think that would be in the air in, in Tennessee. Yeah, well, I, it's... I don't know. I mean, I, really, I just remember, like, I loved movies. I loved, the, I loved those moments in the movies where the music kind of took over. And I wanted to just do that. I was like, I had that, if I could do that for people, then that would be amazing. So how did it actually work when you got to Oberlin? I mean, first, it sounds like you, you had more of a feeling of, of being understood or, or, or belonging once you got there. Yeah, I mean, I remember the first day on campus, and it was just a, it was, that, that is a school for weirdos, you know? I mean, it was just a really... The walking across campus, and it was the first time I'd ever seen like guys kissing each other. I remember that, like that was that was happening everywhere, and it was just like for me kind of shocking at that moment. It was racially diverse, ethnically diverse. I remember politically for me, it was always weird being an Arab kid in Nashville, but like there, there were all these Arab kids who were getting together and like being really politically aware, and like they'd all wear these cafes and like go out and march, and I sort of fell in with them for a second and. And like, it was just a completely different attitude towards like who, who you are. It was a, like, I'm not just going to be who I am. I'm going to be it loudly and yell it and march about it and rah, rah, rah about it. And so like, that was there from the first moment I walked in. With, with like uh, with politics or with, with everything? Everything, everything, like everything. It was a very much like a, it was a very much like an activist culture. A sort of like it was kind of like that bad combination of like entitled kids uh, who have a, a lot to say and prove 
but also like for me it was kind of liberating so i remember that i remember like musically it was kind of amazing like i was writing these really sort of synthy kind of film scores and i walked into a place that was like really rooted in experimental classical stuff so i remember the first moment walking down the practice halls and hearing what people are playing and just it's like your world explodes in those moments you know and you're like you're different and like in a in a moment you know that's how it felt like the first day of college you it's know? like suddenly you're in an environment where you make sense yeah like i it's funny people ask me a lot about nashville and i almost felt like within the first few days of college my 13 years in nashville got, almost got erased like it took me a long long time to come back to my that part of my life and be like wait so what actually happened because like my dad moved back there recently and so i'm now going to visit him and I find myself like just driving around, looking at all these places and remembering and trying to like reconstruct. I feel, it must feel like a huge disconnect. Like, did this, did this really happen? Yeah, there's a little bit of that feeling, you know, I, and I love the place. It's beautiful. It's completely changed. So it's not in any way like I'm not saying anything bad about them. But I do remember the first few days of being at Oberlin's, like everything changed on a dime, you know, just seeing the way that people were acting with each other, seeing the music that people were playing. Uh, Nashville has since become that in many ways, so it's a completely different place than where I grew up. But, uh, but yeah. And w before, when you were growing up, it sounds like music was this really solitary thing for you. W did that change once you got to Oberlin, or was it still a fairly solitary pursuit, except other people were doing it too? A, a little bit of both. I mean, I was now in this position where I had to like learn how to write for like an oboe and a cellist, and then you had to go and find somebody who played the oboe and the cellist, and then you get them together and make it work, which I turned out not to be very good at. Like that part of it, like the- At finding people you mean? Well, no, it's like, it's not so much the finding, but like, um, like so much about being a composer, it turns out to be not just coming up with the idea, but fleshing it out, finding people to play it, then seeing, oh God, my initial idea didn't work because it doesn't sound good on the instruments. And then going through the process again and again. And then it's like, a lot of it is about like solving problems, you know? Figuring out what isn't working here. Yeah, and I, I, I somehow didn't, I wasn't able to do that with music. I would have an idea and I'd sort of work it out. And it made sense when I had like a cassette player and like some synthesizers or stuff. Uh, but it was very hard for me when I got there and had to, to learn to do it for orchestras and for string quartets and stuff. But then at Oberlin, they had this uh, electronic music department where they had these like in the basement of this building, they had these beautiful old arps and moogs, strange modular things like from 1970s, like those things that like literally is the size of a refrigerator where you plug in cables like an operator and they make the most like otherworldly sounds. And I remember like being down there in the dead of night one day, like maybe junior year and discovering that like, oh no, oh, this is what I, this is what I should be doing. There's something about the like immediate feedback where you plug in a thing into a thing and you get a noise back and you realize, oh, it's not the right noise. And so you turn this dial. So the feedback is more the instant, I guess. was so instant, and it was still solitary in some way. That somehow turned it on for me again. I had very quickly, within a couple of years, figured out that I wasn't very good at music in that classic conservatory sort of way. But I was really good at like sitting in the dark with a machine and just pushing buttons and trying to coax out of it something that sounded pleasant. Somehow that just worked for me. Which is basically uh, translates so well. So far from like what I do now, uh, except so many other people are involved now. So the social part of it now makes more sense to me than it, than it did at that point. But but yeah, I mean, I think what I'm doing now is in some weird way an extension of like being in the dark in front of a MOOC. But for me, they're, they're, it's very similar. Like somehow the journalism we do here and that strangely feel like they're not that different. You know, it's like tinkering around and experimenting. Yeah, you tinker around with ideas, you tinker around with noises, you know, and part of it is so social and that you're interviewing people and you're going out and you're discovering things. And part of it is so solitary and that you're trying to sort of stand back from it and like, what did I just learn? Like, what meaning do I take from this? Where, where do these bits of tape, like what order should they go in? So, so, so much of that thinking happens by yourself. Um, and so for me, like that, the show is this constant process of like engaging the world and then withdrawing from it. Uh, and somehow like as a musician, you have to do both. So I, I think back on that in my, my Oberlin days. And you are also studying creative writing, right? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, it was. So um, you were hoping on, on that was being... the thing I fell out of music and into was uh, was writing because I don't know why I made that decision. While you were at Oberlin, you mean you fell out of music and into writing? Yeah, I was sort of like as I was as I was coming to terms with the fact that I wasn't a great musician, or at least I wasn't doing well at it. Not doing well in what way? Just in, in terms of like the, yeah, the scoring like, for an orchestra. Like I wouldn't finish stuff. Like they would be like, "Okay, your 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 task now is to compose for like ten percussionists," and I could never get. I could never finish. Like somehow I would get like halfway there and I'd hit this block like I just couldn't somehow get through it and because so you like, didn't know what to do or because didn't you didn't do it's I just I I don't remember exactly but um maybe it was the social aspect of it like I was composing four people who were gonna show up in a room at four o'clock the next day and somehow the pressure of that just I would get I would block but if you put me in a room with like some things to fiddle with on my own I could somehow like just I could get it done but that wasn't what this was anymore. So I just, I just wasn't, I wasn't completing the assignments. I wasn't writing things anyone liked, you know, I just kind of hit a wall. And so then I made a decision that I would stop doing that or do it less and become a creative writing major, which was something else I had been doing for a while, just writing, you know, short, short fiction and various things. Like even in high school? Yeah. Yeah. Even in high school, but not never in a serious way. And so then I thought, well, maybe I should do that seriously. And so I did that for a bit uh, and just got a minor in music rather than doing a double major. And did you feel, was writing a good fit? Did you, did you feel like you had a, no, sort of I a talent for it? No, the same problem. It's like it turns out like staring at an empty page is just as hard as staring at an empty staff of music. Like it, I ran into the same problem. I'd have, I'd, get, I'd have great ideas and somehow I could never finish them. Like finishing has always been an issue for me, even now. And uh, I mean, I graduated with that. So I at least got it done in that sense. But then I got out into the world and I remember waffling between like, oh, do I want to write music for films or do I want to try and write fiction or write journalism or just write stuff? And I did both for a while. I wrote some music for some short films and for one feature and then kind of hit the wall and realized I'm just, it's just, it's just really hard. You know, it's just like it was hard to make any money. Uh, it was hard to be able to solve problems because like you go to a filmmaker with an idea for what you thought the film needed and, and he didn't like it and I could never come up with the second idea you know like oh shoot okay he doesn't like that but I'm stuck on it I can't somehow like flush my brain of it and go to the next thing so I would have that problem a lot and then when I was writing I was doing a lot of short pieces for various things and that's that wasn't making me any money and it was taking me far too long to do it and so I just kind of like had this like slight crisis moment like three or four years after school i wasn't making ends meet and i was working all the time and it just things weren't sort of developing and so then at that point it was 1995 or six or seven and so i had a day job working at an internet company because like anyone with a pulse could have worked on the internet at that point and, and where, where were you had you like moved to new york i was already? in new york i was living in brooklyn in a loft in williamsburg and um did that for a while and then it is what were you actually doing for the internet company oh it doesn't even matter the dumb shit i was uh i think i was quote producing which at that point meant the client had like this is what i want and the engineers were like this is what i can build and you had to somehow translate between them i worked at a few companies like that and then i remember at one point being like i just i don't want to do this anymore and my then girlfriend now wife was like, okay, well, what, what do you want to do? I was like, I don't know. I, I, I kind of want to do them both, but neither. Like, is there something that you, where you can do them both, but you don't actually do either of them? And they were like, well, maybe you should work in radio because it's kind of like sound. It's kind of music, but it's, it's not. It deals with stories and narratives. So it's sort of like writing too, but it's not. It's like spoken. So there's like the voice, the sound. There's the, the things you write, but it's somehow more visceral, more immediate. So I just started volunteering at a radio station down the street from here. WBAI? Yes, WBAI. But uh, Pacifica. But so you had never really listened to radio before this, it sounds like, or at least not much. No, not much. I mean, I had had the experience a lot of people have where like your dad drives you to school and he's listening to NPR and so therefore you tune it out. I was like that kid for most of my life, um, only vaguely aware of like public radio. And, and had your wife listened to, to radio a lot? Did she well, like? Well, you know, it, weirdly, she had gone. It was a weird confluence of events. 
This is interesting, actually. I don't know that you know this. Uh, so she had gone to a demonstration of a pirate radio setup. So this guy from this little collective called Prometheus Radio, they were teaching people how to do pirate radio broadcasting. And like you get this box, you put it with this box, and you can broadcast out your window and start like a... Broadcasting uh, illegally, basically, yeah, just illegally. with like a car battery. Or... Exactly. And I think the FCC at that time was kind of nasty about like cracking down. And so like these people were real sort of punk rock renegade types. And they would set up these little parties and broadcast it. And then like the, the neighborhood would tune in and then they'd like race in their cars to some other neighborhood. And so she had seen these guys give a talk and she was like, you should come and check this out. So they did, they gave another talk. And at that talk, Amy Eddings, Amy Eddings, who now works at this station, came up and gave a little speech. And uh, she was talking about storytelling on the radio and somehow like her in that context it just, it was super cool. I was like, oh, well, maybe that's really interesting. Let me do that. So I went and talked to Amy, who now works just downstairs. She has no memory of this. I went and talked to her, and, she, and I was like, well, who do I talk to? And she pointed me to these folks at WBAI. And was she, she was just experimenting in radio, or had she no, worked she in radio? she was working I... in radio, maybe at WNYC at the time, probably. And uh, it also had a punk side to her, too, I guess. Yeah, so she, maybe her roots were in this sort of like super hyper local community radio fly by night type thing. So she pointed me to them and I just show up there one day and they put a mic in a, in a recorder in my hands and were like, go cover this protest. And so that day pretty much. Yeah. I mean, it was like it's such a dysfunctional place that like if you show up, um, they will send you out there because they don't have enough time to be able to train you. And so suddenly you're like on the air. Which is so interesting because like Amy Goodman had that exact experience. You had that experience. Yeah, it sounds like Amy Robert. Goodman, Amy Goodman. So like she was like sort of the top dog there. But there's a lot of like actually really good journalists who were just who were making no money. Had They were using old equipment and they were just they just needed help. And so if you showed up, suddenly you were like doing these god awful 12 minute pieces about like some protest at City Hall. And I just did that for a year. You know, I made some of the worst radio that has probably ever been on the radio. But in the process, kind of like figured out the basics, you know, like, okay, here's how you hold the mic. Here's how, here, here are the questions that you ask. Um, okay, so now you got the questions, you put them on this reel-to-reel -reel tape. Here's how you cut the tape. Here's how you write in between this bit of tape and that bit of tape. So it was still cutting tape then? Yeah, it was like going from, I mean, I, I grew up in the age of like computers and MIDI and all that kind of stuff. So I had to sort of like unlearn that stuff, go back to like reel to reel. Because that must have been just at the edge of when that stuff was dis yeah, disappearing. Yeah, it was like it was just changing over at that point. Although I love, I mean, I kind of, part of me wishes it never did because there's something wonderful about actually holding the tape and feeling it in your fingers. Really? Because I was just thinking earlier today, like how impossible your show would be with reel to reel tape oh, because you'd no, have so no many way. like tiny no splinters way. of tape with an um and a laugh. You just... Yeah, you no, just this, go crazy. This show, this show could never happen on a reel to reel. But there's something cool about the way you listen when you're listening on tape. Um, but so yeah, BAI, I did that for a while and really learned learned the craft. But just the sort of the basics of it, like just the the basics of it, sort of like got under my fingers at that point. And then I just started freelancing at that point. I was doing some pieces for NPR. I ended up like kind of loitering the halls at WNYC and working for. Shows like on the media and Studio 360. That sounds like a pretty big leap. Or it was a leap. It took a long time to make. And then you know, 9/11 uh, happened, and like the shit hit the fan, and all of a sudden everything here changed. Everything at WNYC and in New York changed, and the need for documentaries and news went way up. And I just found myself somehow swimming in that stream, and like running around to different places and interviewing people and doing half hour documentaries. And somehow that's where I was when Radiolab began, which happened like in kind of in the wake of all that, the, the schedule here got shuffled completely, you know, to accommodate all this news. And there was a slot that became open Sundays at 8 PM and it was on the AM. And so no one was listening. Turns out that's actually literally true because they would drop the power. So like you couldn't actually get the signal. This was so uh, you guys weren't interfering with Canada signals, right? Yeah, was signals, strangely, signals bounce off the water and like end up in strange faraway places. And uh, and so they had by law to bounce, to drop the power. So I remember actually driving back to Brooklyn one day um, and trying to listen to my show. And I was maybe like 30 miles from the transmitter. And it was just like... <laughs> Like you could not hear my voice through all the static. 
And so like, so you, I, like you didn't realize for a long time that no, for about a year, I was like, I was like, I'm, I'm reinventing radio, <laughs> but actually I was reinventing it for nobody. And did you like storm into the office, be like, what's going on? I ha- no one li- well, can listen you know, to you. You think you're, it's like everything. It's like when you first start, you think you're, you think you're owed everything, but you know, so I, I, I would, I would yell at Michael who was, who was the program director and be like, why aren't, why can't I hire people? Why can't I this? Um, but it turns out like he was sort of sneaking everything in under the radar. So like in, un, in, under the radar and, in, in, in the sense that like nobody ever wanted radio lab, nobody wanted the show. Like he had a sense that like we should try and do some cool new approaches to radio making and experiment. And like, this was a time when like there was a sense that public radio was getting a bit old and tired and we like, let's try new things. Let's try new styles. So he wanted to agitate a little bit, but I'm not sure anyone else did, you know? And so he basically sort of snuck me in and through some fuzzy math was able to pay for me. But I don't think his bosses ever wanted me to be around and they didn't want a new show. So I was asking for all this stuff and I think he was just trying to keep me from being noticed, you know, and keep me around long enough for something to happen. So, you know, there's a couple of years where I I was literally like, I was again sort of alone in, in a room trying to do this thing trying to fill three hours a week. Well, I want to come back to that in a second. But first, sure. like, you had this, such a strong conception uh, growing up that you wanted to to do music for movies. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then it seems like you gave that up, I mean, at least from the sounds of it, relatively quickly. Oh, it's like it got it. No, I, I don't know that I ever gave it up. It somehow got sublimated. The weird thing that I realized when I started doing radio is that, okay, so, like, you go out and you do an interview, right? And... And then you bring that stuff back and then you ingest the sound into the computer. And then it exists on the computer in these little blocks, like little like sound bites. And you can zoom out in your program and you can see all these little bits and pieces, little bits of sound kind of floating around in a nonlinear space. And then you start moving them around and then you start kind of like, oh, okay, well, this block should go here and this block should go over to the right. And ooh, this one looks a little dense. So let me thin that out. And, oh, well, maybe between block one and block two, I need some kind of, like, musical gesture as a spacer. Okay, so then... Wait, so you can do it by look sometimes? I don't... Well, yeah, you're looking at it. Essentially, what you realize is that these things are musical objects. They are speech, they are conversation, they are ideas, but they're also musical elements. And so, and you begin to compose with them. And you also realize when you're on the radio that you're making musical decisions. Your voice rises and it falls you syncopate certain thoughts, you get very quiet and intimate at certain parts, and then you get very adagio at other parts. I mean, you are making musical decisions. And for me, early on, I realized, actually, this is the kind of music that makes sense to me. Um, Because, like, when I was actually making music, it was like, I would get stuck. I didn't quite know what I had to say. But when you're going out and somebody else says something, you are bound by those words. And so it breaks the block instantly. Like, I actually don't have a block. I have reality, and I have to contend with that. So it's like that wisdom about creativity. is It's really at its heart about limits. Exactly. And you have the limits of what someone said. And then suddenly I had that as my material to compose with, and that unlocked everything for me. And so I initially got into radio as a way to make music, but not, not the old way I was doing it, but somehow to make it with with words and thoughts and ideas and interviews and conversation. So even when you were doing like 12 minute documentaries on like a political protest or something, were you viewing it in that way? At that point, no. At that point, I was just trying to figure out what, how the hell someone does this. I was actually trying to, trying to just learn, you know. Um, it really it really got to be like after 9-11, I did this big half hour documentary uh, about this particular place somewhere like near the Holland Tunnel, where like all the firefighters had had gone to. And it was this, I think it was called Nino's, right? And so basically it was like this place where all the firefighters would go to get away from like the crush of media attention. And I got access there to just record, I think 24 hours there. And I remember having all these conversations and not quite knowing what to do with them. There was no real narrative through it. It was just a bit, bunch of different fragments of people chatting about what had just happened to them. Or about and how did you get access if the, the whole point of being there was to hide away? It was, uh, it, was, so it was a weird moment. You know, the rules for life and for New York had been suspended and like people were honest and open in a way that was kind of rare. And so we just asked, 
you know, it wasn't the place that people were going. People were going to Ground Zero. They were going to sort of the perimeter of Lower Manhattan. This was a place that was away, and no one had thought to ask to go there. So I did, and I had all this material, and it was amazing moving tape, but it didn't add up to a story. It added up to some sort of weird portrait. And I remember the process of trying to orchestrate all the voices so that they sort of overlapped and layered on top of one another. And I remember like this moment of feeling like, oh, this is just like, this is just like music. This is just like composition. Like, that's all I'm doing. I'm just making music again, but it's the notes are just different notes now. And that was a wonderful revelation. And was that the moment when you, when you knew like radio actually is what I want to do? It felt like, I mean, it was a moment, you know, I, there, have been, there have been a lot of them, but um, it was one of those moments where I thought I can, I can do what I've always wanted to do. I can write music for films in a way, but the films are somehow unfurling in front of me based on the words that come out of people's mouths, you know? And that's just a, it's a lovely, I still sort of delight in that. I mean, Radio Lab has become about so much more than just that simple, that simple thing. But for me, at the end of the day, the thing that wakes me up in the morning is being able to take a phrase of human speech and just play with it, you know, and, and, and tease out the rhythms and tease out the innate musicality inside a person's voice. You know, that feels like a special, a special, amazing gift that I get to do that, you know. So you have this slot. So it's on Sundays? Sundays at 8 to 11. 8 to 11. Hardly anyone's listening, though you don't know this for quite a while. No, I change hardly anyone to no one. No one is listening. Well, I mean, zero. how do you know? I mean, could you hear it on Manhattan? I mean, surely you must have created. You would have to be hugging the transmitter with your body to get the signal. I mean, I'm, I, I say this based on near... 100% certainty, but I can't be completely certain. But nobody listened. No one wrote in. Nobody heard things. I couldn't get the signal. Um, so anyhow, sorry to interrupt your, what you were saying. But Well, so I, I heard this talk you gave uh, at Third Coast, the Filmless Film Festival, it's called, mm-hmm. the F- Festival for Radio. And, you know, you were talking about the terrible gap, the, you know, the gap that Ira Glass has talked about where, you know, you have good taste and, and you're in a medium or in a pursuit because you know what's good and you know what uh, you like. But then there's where you are, which is not so so great. Mm-hmm. Um, and this gap is sort of like existential angst mm-hmm. boiled down. And it sounds from this talk that you really went through a rough time. Like there was lots of moments where you felt like this was just basically impossible. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I'm trying to think of what it was I, I mentioned there. That, you talk about the German, uh, the forest of darkness or something along oh, those lines. Oh, gosh. <laughs> God, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's. I think Iris was really onto something. I mean, there's also a guy named, uh, I just bumped into recently, a sort of philosopher named Peter Parker, uh, or Philip Parker, I forget his name exactly, but he talks about the tragic gap, this sense of like, you've got the ideal of what you're striving for, but you also have the reality, which you're aware of. And somehow you can't give into either. Like, you've got to somehow like search for the ideal, but not get so divorced from the reality that um, it's a really interesting sort of thought. But yeah, in terms of that, journey that you have to go through in order to sort of how f- find your voice uh, that would that took a long ass time for me um i mean starting at bai uh get, becoming coming here starting the show it's never been easy it's actually been like it's been a long and arduous sort of learning process i mean the the german forest being this particular moment actually you know if you want to talk about moments that actually probably is one of the real moments for me where i i figured out figured out some things I mean, one of the real pivotal moments for Radio Lab was Radio Lab was on the air, on the AM. No one was listening. It was hard to justify, and I think the station was seriously thinking about stopping it. And at this point, it was it was basically you were curating documentaries that had been produced elsewhere. Right, right. And uh, you know, to the credit of the station, they were like, "Okay, we, t- we should fire him, but we don't we don't w- want to because maybe there's something going on there." So. Let's give him something to do. So they, the project that they came up with for me was to create an hour-long documentary about Wagner's Ring Cycle, which is a cycle of operas written by Ricard Wagner in the, I forget when exactly, but for people who love opera, it's like this, it's like the pinnacle of the art form. Now, I didn't know any of this going in. I was just like happy to have the work. So yeah, sure, I'll do it. Um, I didn't actually realize that it's like, it lasts 20 hours and it encompasses 2,000 years of German mythology. There are like 500 characters in the damn thing. 
it's impossible to summarize. Like that, I think that was your job was to was my, my tell my the job. story of this? Yeah, that was my job was to somehow tell the story in one hour of this entire thing. Um, and I was doing it. The people who were sort of my editors were a bunch of opera, opera like aficionados. And so I, 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 they wouldn't let me leave anything out. Like I, I would be like, okay, I just want to like tell this story. They're like, no, you got to talk about Brunhilde. Oh, fuck. Okay. All right, we'll talk about Brunhilde and Wotan and the spear. No, but you also have to talk about uh, the dwarfs. And okay, well, what about the, okay, fine. I'll talk about the dwarfs too. Oh, but you really have to talk about the Rhine maidens and the gold at the bottom of the Rhine river. Oh God. Okay. And it was just like, I could not, I could not find my way through this material. It was like, we actually began to refer to this as the German forest because I, it was, to make a long story short, I mean, at the end of that process, I was up for days and days and days and I couldn't. Literally just like with the computer trying to. It's like, we, you know, we worked on it for months and I could not get it done. There was so much we were trying to cram into it. Plus, it had to sort of be sweeping like the music, but I, how can it be that if I have to talk so much just to summarize the plot? I mean, literally, like the Cliff Notes version of this opera would be like a Proustian novel. Like, there's just no way to summarize it. So, and you um, missed deadlines too, oh right? God, so many, so many. We missed like, I would say, probably five deadlines. And um, I would say three or four all nighters in a row. We get it on the air, and it's really, it does really well. But I remember afterwards, like, I was so stressed out by this experience that, like, any time I was late anywhere, like, my, I was late to meet my wife for dinner, like, I'd look down and I'd see, oh, crap, I'm five minutes late. And I would just, my palms would start to sweat. My heart would start beating really fast. It was like I'd had PSD from this Wagner documentary in some way. Like, you would internalize the doubt that came. internalized, like, the stress to such a profound degree that, like, anything could trigger it afterwards. And this went on for months. But the weird thing was uh, when I when I listened to it later, like weeks later, I actually like it was the it was one of the first times where I, I feel like I recognized I recognized myself. Like actually, this is what I want to do. Like in terms of what how Radio Lab sounds now, that was one of the first moments where like it it clicked, and that it was this crazy sort of soup of music and sounds and ideas and incredible dense amount of thoughts and productions kind of coming in and getting jammed together, but still sort of swirling and dancing and never getting heavy. Uh, I somehow managed to do it for the first time in that documentary. And now everything we do has the sort of ambition and sweep of that, of that thing. I mean, we're doing huge, huge topics that are insane. Like they're just, it's just dumb to even think of it, but we, we embark on these massive explainers trying to take huge amounts of technical information and boil it down and still make it feel like it has a flow and a dance and a lightness to it. And Wagner was the first time I feel like I did that successfully, you know? So it was a series of moments where I realized that the possibilities. And that was, that was one of the first times I crossed that gap that Ira talks about, where I actually got to the other side and I thought, I think I can actually do the things and make the sounds that I have had in my head, you know? And this was when, in like 2004 or something? Yeah, 2004. Four or five, somewhere in that area. So it had been this show, Radio Lab, uh, doing these documentaries, and, and you were doing, starting to play around with sh- sort of short segments in between mm-hmm. uh, when you need to fill the space. Uh, but how did it go from that to sort of these intense sort of five or ten documentaries or stories a year? How did that happen? Because that's like a, a sort of form of radio that really hadn't really existed, and still even today basically barely exists uh it's such a you know you need at least like a a once a week show or something or like Mm -hmm. how do you even fit into a time slot if it's not like once a week how did that happen it it had a lot to do with sort of a a couple of things coming together i mean i was i was doing the show the show sounded and particularly after the wagner thing began to sound the way i wanted it to sound i still hadn't really figured out what was interesting in the world and what i wanted to talk about and i was kind of gradually figuring that out around the time when I just randomly bumped into Robert Kroll, which, I mean, again, one of the ways in which I could justify the show was doing other things for the station, and they would often ask me to make promos. So they, they asked me to make a promo of all of these famous people who had supported the station, and Robert was on the list. I remember going and, like, asking him to make a promo, and we just somehow, like, had this weird chemistry in the moment and began talking. And 
a couple of days later, we're having breakfast. And then the next week we're having breakfast. And then for months, we're just having breakfast constantly. And the, meanwhile, I'm doing radio lab and I'm, you know, staying up all night to make these shows. And then I'd go out to breakfast with him and I would talk about what we, what we did. And I'd say, you know, I got this scientist who is talking about memory. He's telling me this lovely thought about how memories get remembered and remade every time they're remembered. And so like every time you think of a memory, you're actually re-experiencing it, but letting in new information from your present and then memories get kind of colored and tainted. And it's a cool idea, but I don't even know how to talk about it. And then he'd be like, well, maybe you should think about doing a skit, you know, make it into like a, a bit of radio drama. In fact, you know what, Chad, I'll come and help you out. And so then fast forward a couple of days, he and I are there at like six in the morning um, because that was the only time you could get studio time at the, in those days. And I have this tape of a, a really dense interview with a scientist about memory and I play him the tape and Robert's like, okay, let's just, let's imagine like we're, we're in a garden and we're rabbits in a garden. And then somehow like he'd spin out something about like the rabbit is in the garden and the rabbit, what does the rabbit know of the garden? Like maybe, is this the same garden that the rabbit was in last week? Does it have a specific memory of that garden or is it just remembering garden? Like he would kind of, I don't know, he would go off on some riff and then he and I would improvise. And then I would take that tape, you know, later in the afternoon, and I would cut it all up. And I'd think to myself, where can I stick this scientist? Somewhere in here the scientist could go. So I shove her in at some certain places. And then I would listen to it a couple hours later and be like, you know, maybe if we're talking about a rabbit in the garden, we really should make a rabbit in the garden. So we should hear the sounds of birds and wind and leaves and a rabbit chewing on something. So then I'd kind of create that. And then I remember thinking, like, it's weird. Like, these two guys talking, Robert and Jad talking, and then suddenly we're in a garden, which doesn't quite make sense. So maybe I need music, and I could use music every time we go into fantasy world. So I'd kind of score that. And I took this, and we made a five-minute thing about the science of memory rooted in a skit about rabbits in a garden. And I, I, I honestly cannot remember the connection why we chose rabbits in a garden. There's probably some logical reason for it, but... There it was, this five-minute thing. I shoved it into a show that I was making. And I remember listening to that like the next day or whenever it was that it aired and hearing those five minutes and being like, that is the weirdest thing I've ever heard. It's like, I don't know what I'm listening to, but it's kind of amazing. It's like two guys talking. It's like they're having breakfast. But all of these thought bubbles are sort of popping out and suddenly we're in a garden and there's the sound of a garden. And then suddenly, boop, 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 boop. A, pop, a thought bubble comes up and we're thinking about a scientist. And like, it was this weird, surrealistic, multidimensional breakfast conversation. Is that when it took the form? Yeah, that, that was sort that, of like I the mean, pilot almost? Yeah, that in was a this, this uh, inadvertent prototype for, the, for Radio Lab. It was a, this idea of like, you can combine a conversation, a completely imaginary mental space, a real interview with a scientist, Crazy surrealistic sound design, strange multi-layered editing, the kind of raucous energy of conversation alongside the crazy sort of precision of editing. All of that can kind of come in and just kind of collide. And it just sounds interesting. You know, it just sounded interesting to us. But it was only five minutes. And so I remember Robert began to appear as a guest on the show in those early days. And this is still once a week. This, is, this was still once a week. So we would just find little bits, little six or seven minute bits to work on. And we tried to repeat the rabbit in a garden experiment and we failed over and over. I mean, we just made like gratuitous, terrible, terrible skits and it just never somehow took off. But slowly over time, we figured out the rules. You know, we figured out like what, why, why this works when it works and why it doesn't work when it doesn't work. But it was a slow process of just kind of like trying things out in this very like neglected sandbox of like 8 p.m. on Sunday nights. And, you know, to make a long story short, eventually it felt like we kind of we kind of had a groove. And at that point, the station, you know, to their credit, recognized it. And they, they took us out of Sunday nights and they put us on the FM and off we went. Yeah. Uh, well, not quite off. Not, off you not went quite because a bit. I heard the the story that uh, so you were replacing Terry Gross's time slot. Yeah. Okay. Right. And so this, this didn't you didn't right. exactly get a lot of fan mail on this first uh, move to FM. 
Right. So, okay. Yeah, you're right. I didn't, I quite, I sort of shorthanded actually a long and painful passage. So yeah, you're right. Okay. When they finally took us off the AM and they put us on the FM and we were called Radio Lab, and it was Robert and Jad hosting. It was in many ways the beginning of this Radio Lab. Well, our sort of like, what is it you do in Nashville? Like your cotillion when you come out, you know? And our cotillion moment, if that's even the right term, was, um, well, okay, let me just back up for a second. So Ellen Horn, who was the first person I hired, who's now our executive producer, she had this crazy idea that like the way to package this show, because it was a problem, like we had, we had so few of them, like where, what do you do with it? You give it to a station and like they air it as a special and it just goes nowhere. So we were like, okay, the way to package it, she thought up, was to treat it like Shark Week on the Discovery Channel where they take all the shark things and they jam them together and it's like a big event. So why don't we do like Shark Week for Radio Lab? That so was yeah, like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, exactly. same slot. And like people get excited about it and they like, you know, put it into their calendars. It's a thing. So she, we, we sold the station on this Shark Week idea. So the station decides, well, okay, we'll put it in place of Terry Gross, who at that point was airing Fridays, or no, Monday through Friday at three. Huge audience. And every so often, Terry goes on vacation. Um, so we will be like Terry's vacation replacement. Instead of Dave Davies. It, yeah, exactly. Uh, but they neglected to mention to people that this is what was happening. And so we get on there Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and people are like, who are these jackasses that have taken over? What have they done with Terry? Um, now, I didn't know any of this. Like, I thought we were killing. Like, by the time we got to our end of our Friday run, I was like, this is amazing. And then... A few days later, I remember Jacqueline Sincata, who's now, I think, assistant program director uh, or program director here. She sends me the listener services report, um, which are all the people that had called in and they log every single call by whether it's positive or negative. And they have like a, a P for positive and an N for negative in, the, in one of the columns. And then they have like almost a word for word transcript of what people said. And I remember like opening up this document and it was like, pages and pages and pages and pages and pages of vitriol and like people they weren't just they didn't just it, they didn't just not like us they hated us i mean it was like and did that hurt i was i i was like i remember at that point i was like yeah this is okay you thought you were this done this is fun this is fun but clearly we're not gonna this is over um oh god like i remember uh I still have this document somewhere because it's like it feels to me like an important document that I need to keep. Uh, I don't know why. You get it framed. He says something about me, but like I, I can, I could never throw it away. I mean, it was just staggeringly negative. Um, there were a couple of positives in there, so there was at least like indications that we would one day have a fan base. Uh, but ma- mainly, it was just like hatred. And uh, I don't know. To the station's credit, I remember Dean Capello was like that's what always happens like you're just doing your job like don't, if it's you like replacing like, johnny carson no one likes you at right, first right and also the station never said to people like she's coming back like <laughs> yeah. don't worry so they thought you would kill terry yeah, gross essentially thought, like, somehow like they made the terrible decision of taking terry away to put these two guys <laughs> who were singing and dancing and doing weird skits about railroads and rabbits and it was just i mean i would have been i would have been pissed off too frankly but it's like you know yeah so like it was a, it was a very rough entry but uh, you know they, again, to their credit, they just let it, they let it evolve, and they didn't ever pay too much attention to what people said, and they didn't like. There were some real questions, like, how do you make a show that only makes ten shows a year? Like, how do you even make? How do you even justify that? Like, there were some real serious questions we had to answer, and they didn't rush that. You know, they were like, we'll we'll get to that. We'll figure it out. And so they didn't, they didn't react to the negativity. I mean, if I were the program director, I probably would have pulled the plug instantly. But, um, but they didn't. You know, I'm really grateful for that. And are you grateful in a way that you had so much negativity early on in retrospect? Because I imagine that gives you now a, a level of resilience yeah. if, if, if you get bad feedback now. Well, I mean, I, I will tell you that the feedback when it's bad, it always catches you off guard. Um, it's some you're somehow never prepared for it, but because but, it's like you've like crafted this wonderful thing for like your parents or something, and then they're like that's terrible. It must it must feel like that in a way, especially given the time you you spend on these radio hours. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's also I mean like we're we're doing a weird thing here. I mean like we're not that old school objective journalism kind of journalists. Like we 
we put ourselves into these pieces. I mean, this is who we are. And like, yeah, these people on on the show, Jad and Robert, are in some sense their characters, but really they're us. It's like, this is us out there. And like the stuff that we're looking at, stuff we're really curious about as people. And like, you know, I'll talk about my kids on the show. He'll talk about his wife on the show. We get into arguments about God on the show all the time. And that's those are legit. That's real. So when people email in, you know, saying mean stuff, uh, it's completely ordinary. And like, you know it, you expect it. You're like actually in some weird way need to see it in order to know you're doing anything. But at the same time, it still hurts, you know. Um, but, you know, having that sort of big jolt of negativity at the, at the, at the beginning was, was instructive. I was like, okay, when you put stuff out there, A, sometimes people don't like it. But B, it's not yours anymore. You know, it's like it's now a thing. It's out there that people can kick around or they can love or they can hold. It's, it's not of you in, the, in that same way that it was. It's like when saying it, goodbye to your kids when yeah, they go to college. Like you do have, it, 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 there, is something, there is something in that analogy that's really true. It's like when it, when it's you alone in a room, getting back to that sort of motif, it's just you and you can kind of keep it really close. But then when you put it out there, it changes instantly. And like now we regularly have situations where you're working on something until the right up until the deadline and it's, it could be three, four in the morning and you release it. And by nine, people are either applauding or yelling, you know, and it's, it's just a weird, weird feeling to be in to see that kind of response. And sometimes it's just so radically different than you intended. And you just kind of have to roll with it. It's a work for yourself, I guess. Yeah. And also at the end of the day, I mean, like you, you do it, the decisions we make are because of the people you work with, you know, it's somehow not about the audience in the end, even though it's for the audience, you know, you try and try and get Robert to see things your way. Try and get Soren or Ellen or Lynn or Tim or any of the people that work for me now, Try and get them to see it, and like we, we're trying to sort of convince each other, and they become. Is that genuine? Um, like it, when you have positions on the actual program, like say on uh, a certain idea or scientific theory, uh, you'll both take positions. Uh, and are those pretty close to the the original positions you had when you were discussing the idea, say on say on choice or anything like that? Uh, I don't know if it's the original position, but it's uh, it's it's for real. You know, um, here's how it's here's how I'd put it. Let me see if I can give you an example. That, that's a real example. Hmm. Oh, what would I? What would I choose? I don't know. I, I can't think of a. Uh, I mean, it happens so often that I'm somehow drawing a blank. As to so, like the, the latest one with things, Robert oh, has yeah, a more yeah, visceral yeah, yeah. attachment sure, to. Sure. Sure. Okay. Well, that that's sort of a that's that's sort of a fun one. But like, we choose ideas that we don't know how to feel about. I mean, like that's one, on purpose. On purpose, and so like you know. We choose ideas that are not like binary, you know, it's not like there's this way of seeing it and there's that way of seeing it. There's this weird network of different places you could stand inside this idea. And we love the ideas for that reason. And so like this idea of like objects, the attachment we have to objects is one of these things where Robert feels strongly in one direction. And I was sort of like a little bit on the other direction. Maybe I was more in the middle, but because he was being so strong in his, you know, like his romantic attachment to objects, Somehow he, I felt like he was pulling things in a direction and I just naturally wanted to pull the opposite direction. Um, that's a real instinct. But it's because somehow you want to give voice to all the different thoughts that are inside this little like stew that you're interested in. Uh, and, and the great thing about being a duet rather than just a sort of solo is that you can be different points in the prism in a way. Like you can deliberately explore the polarities of certain things like right. it would just even if it was produced to the same degree and with the same skill it, it changes the show to have it with the two of you compared yeah. to just and it's like as much as possible i mean the show like having two hosts sucks when we both agree frankly it's like hard it, i mean it's like a, you, you then you run into questions of like who narrates this piece and who narrates that piece and but there, it, it's amazing in the many 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 times when we have different opinions uh and whether that's an a confrontational thing or an argument or whether we're just seeing things differently. I love that. I love what that can offer us. It allows you to go into places and not to have to like come to a conclusion. Both people can be right and wrong at the same time. And I like that. You pose sort of. questions without answering them. Yeah, exactly. And then increasingly this, the, the answers we get to are somehow like these weird um, contradictory paradoxical little 
places where like two truths can be both true but incompatible. You know, we like we we bump into that, we come into that morass over and over, which I actually find like is somehow because that's actually how I feel like the world works increasingly is that there are multiple truths, but then and that they are contradictory, but they are still somehow both true. Well, I guess that's the the moment of sort of wonder almost, or connected to the moment of wonder. And uh, I mean, in so many different places, you've talked about how, even in this interview, how the show is in a way wanting to get to wonder, but not in a sort of easy way. You want to earn those those moments where you're really pondering the the big things, and and you're sort of this ant in this gigantic universe of, mm-hmm. of existence. And it occurs to me that in the way you you talk about wonder, it, it seems like there's something almost spiritual uh, in a way. Like, and I would just want to ask you, like, what, I guess, what does wonder do for you, or, or the idea of wonder? Hmm. And is it spiritual? Yeah, maybe, maybe it is. Um, I don't know. It's like a, the way that I think about it increasingly these days is. And maybe it's maybe part of it is still that kid alone in his room in Tennessee. Uh, but part of me feels like I never, like I missed that day in school where people explain to you how the world works, you know, like the way that basic things about the world work. Somehow I missed that day, and I just, I've always felt like, how does this world actually work? And the show is this incredible gift now because it's this way that I can engage the world and I can I can step forward I can be like so wait how does that actually work let's find out and let's actually walk step by step in a rigorous way and this is where the science often comes in to get to the edge of what we know and that moment of wonder is the point where you hit the wall or you step right up to the edge of the pier and you look out and you see the edge and you see all the stuff that we don't yet know and for me that's a deeply personal thing it's the moment where i feel like i'm a part of this world but i'm also a part of something so much bigger and if that can i mean that's what i'm hoping to give myself with each story that we do and if we can give that to somebody else we can lead them step by step to that moment of wonder then i feel like that's that's my my only measure of success you know just getting to those moments bringing someone else there you know like somehow it's like it's somehow there's something basic to me about like doing it with someone it's like doing it with robert it's like makes all the difference in the world and then giving someone else that that experience but yeah at the end of the day it is somehow just standing in awe of the world the wonderful weird strange sometimes scary awe of the world around us because that's why i like the show i think connect to it is you'll you go on these journeys and you think about these big really at times i think scary questions especially if you're considering them in isolation Things like the, the nature of good and, and death and all just all sorts of sort of really difficult questions. How much control do we have of our own minds and our own decisions? And so you'll you'll go through this journey through listening to the show. And in the end, uh, you know, I, I am often left with that, that sense of, of wonder. And it occurs to me there's something tremendously life affirming about wonder, because even when it's scary, it's like for that moment, you've sort of lost your self-consciousness. It's hard to have a moment where you're really pondering that mm-hmm. and, and being in awe and feeling feeling self-conscious or feeling bad about yourself. Yeah. It's funny. I mean, I, the way that I was thinking about it, I, had, I was just thinking about the other day is like, like the idea of like, what is wonder in some weird way? It's like this moment where like, if you think about that old dichotomy of like your, your left brain is a, is the thinking brain and your right brain is the feeling brain, which isn't true exactly, but there are these distinctions, there are all these differences inside of us. And I always find that when you think really hard about something, there is this moment where that thinking resolves into a feeling. And it's often the feeling of wonder, the feeling of like, if you're so interested in something and focused on it, it will resolve into this feeling of wonder. And that is a moment when all of you is united. The part of you that thinks really hard and the part of you that feels, they come together in that feeling, you know? And that's why I think it's such an interesting and a powerful emotion if you can convey it to somebody. It is a unifying feeling. It's the feeling that, that all of them is holistically engaged in whatever it is they're engaged in. It's not just an intellectual activity. It's not just an emotional activity. It's a visceral, full, complete engagement in something. And if you can do that with your stories, I feel like what more, what more could you ever hope for as a storyteller? 
but just to give per- a person that feeling of wonder and to take them over completely, you know? And are you able to get those moments when you're actually making it? Because it's such a, a grueling process to actually make such an involved show that's so highly edited. I- sure. Yeah, I mean, you, 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 you work at these stories and the stories are just battling you back and they so badly want to suck. But then somehow there's always that moment where like, not always, but often that moment where like you, you're in the 12th draft and this thing that formerly felt wooden and heavy and dumb and lecturing suddenly just stands up and walks off. And you, and it always feels mysterious to me. Like, But when it somehow gets its legs and it can suddenly just tiptoe off, then, you're, then you listen to it almost as a listener would and you're as enjoying or amazed or whatever of it as, as somebody else would be. And it gives you that feeling back. And really all you're trying to do is just get back to the feeling you had at the beginning of whenever you discovered this idea. It gave, it filled you with this fever and you want to somehow construct that for other people. Uh, and sometimes it takes months. To the get point that. between those two uh, yeah. could be quite far apart. But you're just trying to get to that very basic beginning thing. You're not trying to build anything that's super logical. You're just like actually trying to build a ladder for people so they can walk right up to it, you know? Well, to end off, You've talked a lot about how the show, it was born out of sort of just raw experimentation. And in the way, that's sort of its uh, lifeblood. That's the, the essence is, is trying to explore and ask big questions and, and sort of throw yourself into the ditch. I mean, that must be hard now that you have a huge audience. You're one of the top podcasts in the world and, you know, you're on so many stations. So can you talk about that? Like, how do you try to keep it fresh and stay in that spot where there isn't that weight of expectations on you and where, you know, it's you're basically back in the Terry Gross phase uh, Mm -hmm. in a way, because now if you like, well, as a sidebar, like you recently did something quite different with the 60 words episode where you looked at something political instead of more science based uh, or philosophy based as much. Is that an attempt to do that? And I guess, yeah, where are you with with that? Very deliberate. Um, yeah, that's in a way like the question you're asking is the question that is that I'm carrying around all the time. I mean, I, I'm asking myself that question in a million different ways right now uh, because it is in some way we're, we 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 never thought through it to this point where like I never thought this thing would work. I never even thought you and I'd be having this conversation. Like somehow none of this is was according to the plan. Uh, and so here we are. And we have to plan to get here. No, there was there would there would have been no. Yeah, I, if you I pitched the show even and no, had Robert attached uh, no, from the no beginning, it probably wouldn't no, work. No, I think rightly everyone would have just rejected it. Uh, it needed a long circuitous sort of development process or non-development process. But so here we are. We you're right. We have we have like a really big audience now, um, and a really uh, like engaged audience. Like they don't just consume this stuff casually. Like they really listen to it. And if you screw up, which we do, they will tell you. And it's really hard to experiment in this condition, you know, in this circumstance. And this is a show that I think is only as ever as strong as the risks we take. Somehow, like somehow we, that's our mission. Our mission is to take risks. Somehow that's our peculiar mission. And, um, and whenever you take risks, there's going to be times when people don't like what you do. Yeah, which is, you know, reviewing the last few years has happened quite a number of times. So uh, it's it's been very, I mean, we got to a place, frank, speaking frankly and honestly, where like, you know, maybe two years ago, I was really frustrated. At, I mean, it's like there's only so many times you can make, sonically make the sound of a neuron firing before you just want to throw yourself out the window. And we were getting into a mode where we were just, we were doing stories that we loved, but they were somehow the same kind of stories. And um, about a year ago, I think, you know, I just sat everybody down and I said, you know, we started doing very small experiments. You know, I, th- I, I told people, go and look at the Supreme Court docket. Pick, pick, a, pick a case. Do a story about a case. I, I don't know if that's even a good idea, but let, let's try it. Um, now, you know, We've sort of had the same questions about, like, again, that thing I was saying about, like, I don't understand how the world works fundamentally. Like, that extends far beyond science, too. Like, how is it that we're still in a, in a war in 2014 that began in, tw- in 2001 that's still being justified by 9-11? How does that work? Like, legally, politically, how does that work? 
that just feels to me like a really important question. It's as big in some ways as like, what is time? What is consciousness? Like how it's about this weird law of unintended consequences. So we got went off and did that. And we've, we've just been really trying very hard to choose things that just take us farther and make us bigger and just make us get back to that place that we were in right before we went on the air. And, and do you avoid on. what like reading feedback or is there anything you do to try to stay in that I, space? I don't read the feedback anymore. Um, on purpose to because of yeah. that? Yeah, because just like because it, it's even if it's good, it somehow the stuff gets in your head. It gets loud in your head. And uh, like luckily we do these live shows. And so you meet people and you see them and you can have a chance to kind of like get the vibrations back and understand like the things you're doing that might be working and not working. And that feels to me like honest feedback. But like I don't read the comments. I probably should, but I just don't anymore. It feels to me somehow like those voices, that very, very small minority of people who who get on a comment and say something have a disproportionate effect on the people who make the stuff. It feels distorted in some way, uh, in a way I'm not comfortable with. So yeah, you have to somehow like, you have to be very, very careful about who you listen to. At the same time, you have to be very, very open hearted so you can't close off. And so part of me like in trying to sort of like honor the second part of that is just to thrust us into new topic areas, you know? Like we're just going in every direction right now. And, it, and it's kind of a scrambled eggs sort of moment for us. Right now? Right now, yeah. I mean, I think people got very, we ourselves internally got very comfortable thinking of ourselves in a certain way a couple of years ago. And I'm, I'm no longer like interested in thinking of ourselves that way. And I don't know what the new thing is, but it may have to do with stories that are much more like about investigative pieces. I and mean, that could be it. It could be stories that have as much to do with sports and than is anything else. I don't know. I mean, we're just going in so many different directions right now because it's in a way like we're back at the beginning. At least that's what I'm trying to get us to. At the same time, doing it in front of people, you know, and not doing it's it. quite just, the paradox. Yeah, and not doing it just while you're alone in the room and no one's listening, you know. And, and so where do you see this show going? Do you have any ideas? Or basically, at the end of the day, do you see it as a way to... You, for you to ask and, and for the team to ask sort of the fundamental questions that, that most captivate you at any, any one moment. Yeah, I, I still see it that way. I still see it that way. I think the questions we're going to ask are going to hopefully lead us to be a little more outside. I feel like... Outside of... Everything. Outside of the studio, outside of our first assumptions, outside of the people we normally talk to. I feel like that's... That's one of our missions right now is just to get outside, to go outside, uh, to leave our our to leave our comfort zone, I guess. And, you know, I mean, but at the same time, not completely blow up what you're doing. So, like, we're still doing a lot of the same things. But I mean, there's a certain percentage of the time that I want to be scared and I want people who work for me to be scared. And I want us to be talking about things that we have no right to talk about, you know. Like there's just that just has to happen, or else there's no point in doing this anymore. One or three times you you'll throw yourself uh, into the forest. Yeah, I mean, I feel like there has to be a, there's a there's a ratio. There's like a German forest ratio <laughs> that I feel like has to be maintained. One out of every three times you should be not all the way in, but maybe like a, a, on the edge. Spin around know? a few times and close yeah, your eyes exactly. and see if you can find your way out. You don't want to get all the way into the German forest <laughs> have, out of experience. That's just not it's not healthy, but um. You have to get. You have to somehow always have the scent of spruce in your nose, some weird way. Well, I mean, it's such a, a sort of fitting, fitting metaphor for the show itself because, as a listener, it always seems like we're going on an adventure and we don't quite know where where it'll end up at the end, and and that's most of the joy on, on this end of the radio. So, continue getting lost uh, occasionally, and uh, it's, it's such a, a great, awe-provoking program. And thanks so much for joining me today. Oh man, it's been my pleasure. Thank you. That's it this week for Radio Waves. Thanks to Christina Peters for editorial help. Our logo design was by Joseph Nowak. 
And a very special thanks to J.P. Davidson for helping out with the sound. Music provided by The Years and Pottington Bear, both found at the Free Music Archive. If you want to get in touch with us or to subscribe to the podcast, you can visit us online at radiowaveshow.com or give us a shout through Twitter. Our handle is at radiowaveshow. And a special request if you listen through iTunes, if you could write us a review or give us a star rating, it would be a big help. Until next time.